Callie Carvajal. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> wherever I stand, wherever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, there's this force and energy called God. Today is Ask the Minister. Today is question and answer because I flew in and on a plane at 8 o'clock last night and there was no time for me to talk, so it's up to you to come up with the really interesting questions <laughs> that make this a compelling service. No pressure. And if you're online watching this in real time, it's 11 o'clock, 11.20 Pacific time, um, right now you can go to our Zoom room where you can ask these questions. Uh, we're monitoring the Zoom room. There's a chat room in the Zoom room. And so those of you online get to participate. So I'm going to talk for a minute so you have an opportunity to come up with a question. And nothing's out of bounds because everything is spiritual. Any question you ask is a spiritual question. And that's why 
always on these occasions promise to respond, not necessarily to answer. <laughs> so with that caveat, <laughs> I just want to tell you a little bit about my spiritual journey on this vacation. So it was an interesting opportunity with COVID last year. I think I went away for a week, a week and a half took a break at the holiday, but I didn't have a real vacation because there was always just so much to do and what we're going to do, stay at home again? So <laughs> this year, it was really amazing to open up, so we planned this grand family vacation and we spent two weeks in New York at our apartment in New York City and I got to see some great shows. But we were with the kids 24-7, JD and I and the two little ones. So we did manage to get some, some help and uh, get in some great Broadway shows. And then we went for a week with family in Atlanta and stayed with my dad and stepmom for a week. And you know what the saying is, right? Your family not only pushes your buttons, they installed them. <laughs> so it was a great opportunity, let's put it this way, to look at myself <laughs> and to look how I get triggered. And even uh, after years and years in this spiritual journey, I found myself in the middle of a heated argument with my father at my daughter's birthday party. <laughs> and it was like, woo, you're really doing good, Reverend. <laughs> so um, in the same moment, I was able to see it and to clean it up. And one of the amazing and wonderful things about it is, you know, when I learned here at Unity and in my 12-step program that I'm a member of too, is that you're always responsible to clean up your side of the street, right? And so I got a great demonstration of how when I apologized and cleaned up my side of the street, that is not necessarily meant with an apology from the other side of the street. <laughs> and that is another spiritual lesson about how to just stand in that and stand integrity in that my responsibility is my spiritual life and my integrity and my honesty and my apology and my amends. No one else's. No one's. And then we got to live in a tent for a week. <laughs> Four of us in a tent. And you know, at my age, it was fine. I love the outdoors. We were in the mountains of Colorado. It was beautiful. But I forgot that, you know, you have to crawl in and out of tents. They don't usually make tents at eight feet tall, so you can walk in like an adult. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> next time, RV. RV. <laughs> uh, but also, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all of that, stuff, family stuff and triggers, and we were with family camping, us in-laws, I was able to do what I promised, to have the difficult conversations with people who don't necessarily agree with me about some difficult subjects, right, about gun control, about politics, immigration, things that matter about how we treat other people, about LGBTQ issues, about abortion, and it was challenging and inspiring. I'll tell you this one story about my, after my breakdown with my father, uh, by screaming about, at me about Nancy Pelosi. Somehow, because we're here in San Francisco, we own Nancy Pelosi, too. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and then I was talking, he got escorted out of the room by my 18-year-old nephew. <laughs> and I was sitting with my, with my stepmother, and uh, she said, and we were talking, and she said, well, you know, were you really concerned about the direction of this country. And I looked at her and said, I know, so am I. <laughs> and she said, yeah, but we're right. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to laugh <laughs> and we got to understand the problem a little more. And that uncomfortableness, that stretching, that challenge, right? That challenge is what I had promised to you after Uvalde, right? That I would do those things. And I think it is a opportunity for spiritual growth because I am not perfect in it. <laughs> not anywhere near, but what I am is willing, willing to do it.
because that willingness to be changed, to be changed at core. I mean, because if, we, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Right, folks? You know what that means, right? We want the world to be different. Who has to be different? Me. So with that, I open it up to questions for us. What's up for us? If you're online, you can type it into chat. Do we have one already, Serena? Yeah, we, we do. So Rita's going to start two. us off. For those of you in the room, before Sarita speaks, for those of you in the room, there's two microphones set up at the end of these aisles. If you have a question, just come up and speak into the microphone. And we need you to do that so that people online can hear you. Okay? Thank you. So Sarita, go ahead first. Yeah, we have a question uh, from Nelson. It says, what are the best ways to live into our teachings between Sundays? Between Sundays. Yeah. <laughs> Great question, Nelson. Thank you. So um, my practice has always been that I do prayer. Prayer is essential to me. And because I'm a verbal person, meditation is great for me. I love sitting in the stillness and looking at how crazy my mind is right? <laughs> and how I can calm it. But actual prayer is really powerful for me because even if I'm alone and I'm praying out loud, I hear myself and I watch it shift. So when I pray with you on Sundays or when I pray with anyone else, if we're having a meeting or a class and I'm praying, prayer is the most powerful way to practice the truth daily for me. And without affirmative prayer, I would not be having the life I have today. So that for me is the most powerful way to do it. Now, there's silent unity. How many people know about silent unity? 1-800-PRAY-NOW. 24-7, you can call Silent Unity and pray with another individual. You can click the button on our website and request a prayer from our prayer chaplains. You can pray with the prayer chaplains here after service or before service. They're wearing the white stoles that Mighty has on and Dave has on. Right? You can call me. You can get on my calendar and we can pray together. Um, and for those of you who, were, who are triggered by the word prayer, good for you. <laughs> that is your opportunity for hearing, healing. You know, there's no other word for it that describes what it is. But understand when, when I say prayer, I mean affirmative prayer, which means not beseeching, not begging, but affirming that the divine, the energy of life itself, the universe, whatever the hell you want to call it, is working for my highest and best right now. And as I open to that, everything changes. Right. I think we have a question over here. Cindy. Um, so I can't relate at all to being triggered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do have a hypothetical question about it. Um, what have you found um, among the unity practices that helps in a triggering moment, that helps you step back and take a breath? Because what I find is my reptilian brain just goes... It takes over, and I'm just, I'm all in. So, yeah. not that that ever happens, but. <laughs> <laughs> Except for yeah. the fight I had with my son two weeks ago over dinner, where we ended up screaming at each other, which was terrible, and I apologized for it the next day. But wh how, what? What? Help me here. What's the best practice? Doing it. Doing so, it. yeah, so. What's the best practice? Same question, different, slightly different. It was one question of what were you doing during the week? It was prayer. And in the med what's the next practice in the middle of it, right? Is self-awareness. Know thyself, right? It's as ancient as the Greeks, right? Greeks, Christians, Romans, doesn't matter. Uh, Hindus, Buddhists, all spiritual teachings are the same. That's why our name is unity. <laughs> Get that? <laughs> there is only one, one power, one presence, one God. So what it is, is in that moment, you become aware that you got triggered. For example, one of the things I was having what seemed to be a casual but uh, important conversation with my brother and my father. And in the midst of it, my father got so triggered by uh, my challenge, intellectual challenge of him, that he grabbed my arm, right? And it triggered my physical abuse as a child. So I got triggered, and so I escalated. And so what I apologized for was my escalation. In retrospect, I could see it. 
in the moment, I was triggered, <laughs> right? That's the whole point of it. We cannot take sometimes stop the train when it's leaving the station. But we can then go back and say, this is what I did. This is what happened to me, and I apologize. I shouldn't have done that. And that is the most important thing. But then the second component of it, so we clean up that part of it with others. There's a spiritual practice of being um, in the four agreements. Everyone heard of the four agreements, right? Be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally, right? In those agreements, is impeccable with your word is meaning to clean up your stuff, right? And what they did, what my father did, what, whatever, with your son you said you had your fight? Yeah. With your son mm-hmm. wasn't about you. It wasn't. Do we not get that? It's about them. Right? Because what I did wasn't about my father. It was about my stuff. Because otherwise I can see it. The other part of this is we live in this world of constant negative news. Right? And there's this incredible need for balance for information to know what's going on in the world and not succumbing to the negativity of it. Right? And so... In both, we have to find our center. That's why prayer, meditation, and accountability, integrity are important. So it sounds like the fight is a breakthrough. It's an absolute breakthrough if we let it be. This isn't the first fight you've had with your son, right? No, it's always over politics. <laughs> no, this is, okay. no. So it's not the first fight I had with my father either. <gasps> right? And the last time we had a fight like that, it was really healing because a lot of truth got spoken once the storm had passed. And I'm affirming that that's going to happen in this moment too. So awareness. Know thyself, Cindy. Know what your triggers are. And the awareness of the triggers can lessen them. Oh, look at that. Isn't that funny? I'm so predictable. (laughs) I'm so easily manipulated. And if you think you're not, that's your trigger. (laughs) Because look out. You're going to get blindsided by it. Right? Because we think intelligence is going to come overcome it. It's not about intelligence, folks. It's about emotions. And emotions tell us what we value. So something I value, something you value, something you value gets, sets off the trigger. I'm disrespected. That's hurting someone else. That's not right. And so our values are challenged, we think, by someone else. And that's the belief that someone else can control the tr- our experience. Right? Forget that. We believe that someone else, some other person's actions, controls our experience. And that's not true. Now, <laughs> I'm t- saying this from the point of a person who failed miserably at it very recently. Right? That's helpful. <laughs> okay? But what I'm, I'm here to affirm and why I love this job and why I love all of you is that we're all on this journey to know that together. No one else can control our experience unless we let them. Thank you. Helpful. Right? Yeah. Hey. Anything online? One, one more online? Yeah. And then I'll, yeah. This is from Henry. How to practice spiritual assertiveness to stand up and speak for ourselves in relationships. Mm. <laughs> Can you, so one more time. This is from Marie. Uh, from Henry. Henry. Yeah. Yes. Henry. So it says, how to practice spiritual assertiveness mm-hmm. to stand up and speak for ourselves in relationships. Great. So again, it's, it's we all just having the same experience, right? There's only one of us here, right? How do we stand up for ourselves in any situation, in any situation or a romantic situation, a, a partnership, uh, 
and do it without being the aggressor, <laughs> right? Or about playing the victim. So it goes to levels of consciousness, Henry, and for all of us. Are you the victim of the other person? And it goes for Cindy and Mike's question too. Are we the victim of the other person? Or are we the victor, meaning that we're gonna champion over this situation. We're gonna mow the, the, the villain or the aggressor down. Third might be, are we a channel? It's the four levels of consciousness. Victim, victor, channel, vessel consciousness, or verity, oneness consciousness. Oneness, that place in meditation where we get, where we understand the divine and I are wherever I am, God is. What Kali just sang, where I speak, where I stand, God is. So in those moments, you have to identify for yourself, what we get to do is identify for ourselves what level of consciousness are we operating from. Is this person I'm in relationship with against me and I'm the victim of that person? Is this person, am I mowing over this person? Or am I one? Am I one with the divine at this moment? Can I know in this moment that my good, my needs can be met and so can theirs? But be willing to state our needs. This is my desire. This is my spiritual truth. This is what I desire. And know that that person you're with is not responsible for fulfilling it. I'm going to say that again. That person you're with that person you're in relationship with, whether it be romantic or whether it be friendship or whether it be family, is not responsible for fulfilling your needs. Who's responsible for fulfilling your needs? <laughs> oh! So when we believe that someone else is responsible for giving us what we need, we're out of integrity again. We are responsible for loving ourselves. <laughs> And when we love ourselves and care for ourselves and stand up for ourselves, so will the universe. So will other people around us. So we can let them off the hook, our parents, our children, our lovers, our friends. They are not responsible for fulfilling our needs. It, that that basic understanding that the world tells us that you're supposed to seek out these people who are going to help you and support you and fulfill you is where all of our problems come from. Because when they don't, because they're taking care of themselves, we blame them. We make them the enemy. Any of you who have been in a long-term romantic relationship knows this happens. <laughs> you get upset about yourself. You get worried about something in your life. And you look at your partner and go, oh, why aren't they doing what I need them to do? <laughs> and it's not about them. Get that? It's about you. So how, Henry, do you step up and take care of yourself and state what you need to state so that you can allow that into your life? It may not be from the person you think it's going to come from. But it will come when you bring it first. Marty. Not long ago, someone did something that was so offensive and potentially dangerous, i.e. COVID. Can you turn the mic up a little bit towards your face, to your mouth? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and it, it, it was so offensive and potentially dangerous, i.e. COVID, and I was exposed to this and I've been obsessing about it and I'm not ready to forgive this person mm -hmm. and yet I know that until I'm ready to forgive myself for the obsession and forgive him for what he did it's going to eat me up right but I don't want to forgive him I am not ready and I'm aware of that I think I'm ready to forgive myself for the chatter and for the uh, reaction that I'm having, but I'm not ready to forgive him. So uh, 
I'd like to soften this in my mind, because I know I'm not going to change this other person, but I want to soften myself and not be so angry and hurt at what happened. Great. So is there a question there? The question <laughs> is, is since I'm not ready to forgive this other person, uh, how can I stop the chatter in my mind? And I've tried prayer and meditation and, you know, breathing and <laughs> all the skills that I'm very good at, yeah. but it's Great. not working. Yeah. So uh, anyone here have, a, uh, let me ask it this way. Excuse me one second. Mario, I'll come back to you. Anyone here have someone in their life they've not forgiven 100%? <laughs> <laughs> but come on. <laughs> Anyone here have someone they've not forgiven 100%? <laughs> okay. The rest of you, I, we should talk. <laughs> okay? So forgiveness is a process, not a destination. Get that? It is a process, and it is a process we undertake over, and, and Scripture tells us how many times do you have to forgive your brother? 70 times 70. Infinity. 70 times 70. Right? You must forgive your brother 70 times seven. And the way you forgive, I get this question all the time. How do you forgive? You do it. You do it. Remember Charleston, South Carolina? Mm -hmm. That gentleman who came into a prayer meeting at a church and mowed down nine people at that church because of the color of their skin? Their relatives mm -hmm. at his sentencing walked up to the microphone like this and forgave them. And they forgave him for the same reasons you just described, Marty, because the anger and the hatred was eating them up. Yes. And they were aware of that, so they chose to forgive the unforgivable. Yes. And it's a choice we take every day. So for all of us, have we all done things that have hurt other people? How many of us have done that? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right, right. Do we expect to be forgiven for those things? Yes. Hopefully, right? <laughs> or otherwise we live our lives in shame. Those things we think that are unforgivable turn into toxic shame, and then we think we're unworthy. So the same thing why you can't forgive this person is why you can't forgive yourself for the things you think you've done wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's this vicious spiral of I'm unforgivable, so someone else has to be unforgivable too. I, what I've done is so heinous and I can't forgive myself and I'm not going to forgive them either. And we don't do this consciously, but we think that we are so flawed and so bad that we cannot be forgiven. And even if it's just the size of a mustard seed, that's toxic to us. Because then all of a sudden, someone who does something that we find so offensive becomes the, the epicenter of it for us. Absolutely. Right, yeah. and you're living that. You're being a great yes. example of it, right? And what's the key, the spiritual <laughs> key to it, is to realize that we are human beings having this experience on this planet called Earth, to learn, to make mistakes, and to grow from them. So back to the beginning. Prayer, affirmative prayer, self-awareness, and forgiveness. Self-awareness and forgiveness. Loving ourselves yes. first so that they are free to love other people in their imperfection. Because they're just like us. Back to the joke with my stepmother. But yes, but we're right. <laughs> That's what we think too. <laughs> right? And I looked at her and said, well, I guess we can agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Hmm. Yeah. So we have something to agree on that we both think we're right. <laughs> huh. hmm. So. You forgive him because it's the best thing for you. Yeah. 
The ultimate irony, can I point this out? And maybe those of you who are smarter than me have already caught it. Marty was upset at, so at someone about COVID, which he did not get from this person. Correct. But he won't forgive the person for it. And he didn't get sick from it. But what is making him sick right now is his unforgiveness. Would you say that again? It's so important. <laughs> Marty was upset about someone potentially giving him COVID because of some behavior. He did not get sick. He did not get COVID. But he is sick right now yes. because he is spiraling in anger, hate, and unforgiveness. Makes no sense. <laughs> Human beings. <laughs> Aren't we crazy? Yeah. Right? And everyone here. Thank you, Marty. Because everybody here does that in yeah. some way, shape, or form. And thank you so much. Thanks.